Well, hello. Hello, Dr. Nick. Hello, Cecily. Let me just uh, change this view. Okay, so um, good evening once again. Let's um, start as usual with a short meditation on the breath. So just sit in your best meditation posture. <clears throat> then find your breath where it goes out and comes in through your nostrils. Then just generate a strong determination to focus on your breath without distraction for the next uh, two or three minutes. Okay, so let's do that. Thank you.
<clears throat> so now let's generate bodhicitta motivation. Think, the purpose of my life is to lead all sentient beings from suffering to enlightenment. In order to do that, first I have to reach enlightenment myself. And that depends upon my completing the path to enlightenment through studying, thinking about it, meditating on it, and achieving all the realizations on the path from devotion to the Guru all the way up to the 10th Bodhisattva stage and then the practice of Tantra. Since this is a long and sometimes difficult path, I will, I'm sure to encounter many obstacles and problems. So I need to learn how to transform those problems into the path. Therefore, I'm going to participate in this session tonight on transforming problems into happiness. In order to reach enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Uh, before we start, anybody got any questions from uh, last week's session? We started reading Lama Zopa Rinpoche's book, Transforming Problems. Nobody? Okay. So, um, so the last section we read was the fault of seeing only problems, and the next section is seeing the benefits of problems. So when you perceive a problem, uh, if you remember the benefits of having problems and approach it with the practice of Mahayana thought transformation, your problem becomes desirable. Instead of, instead of hindering you, your problems become good and useful. Um, so there's a short text that you might be familiar with called the eight verses of thought transformation. Um, and uh, that's um, um, totally relevant to uh, this topic, what we're doing. So we might um, have a look at that. I don't know about today, maybe next week. But I'll s did everybody get the links that Bob kindly sent out last week? Um, so uh, we'll send out some more tomorrow. If, uh, that's okay, Bob? Uh, okay, so no matter how many problems you have, there's no point at all in being disturbed or irritated by them. When you meet miserable, undesirable conditions, it's extremely important to think over and over again of the great shortcomings of perceiving them as problems and of being irritated by them. There's no benefit perceiving circumstances in this way. It is simply unnecessary to see them as problems.
you may have a measure of control over certain situations, but there are others you just have to endure. For example, no matter how upset you are that your house is not made of gold, you have no power to turn the bricks into gold. And no matter how upset you are that the sky is not the earth, you cannot turn the sky into the earth. There's no point in expending even a moment's concern about such things. No matter how much you worry about any external problems, and no matter how irritated you become, your irritation cannot make the problem go away. As the Indian master Shanti Deva explained in his uh, famous work, you know, the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life, if a problem can be solved, there's no point in being upset about it. There is no reason to be angry and no reason to be depressed. So, you know, if the problem can be solved, don't get upset, just, just solve it. And if the problem is something that cannot be changed, there's also no point in being unhappy, in disliking it or getting angry. Therefore, no matter what happens, there's no point in being angry or depressed. No matter what happens, there's always a reason to think this is a favorable, beneficial condition. For example, when someone is bitten by a poisonous snake, cutting away the, fl cutting away the flesh around the bite is regarded as beneficial, although it's painful. It's not considered harmful because it protects one's life. According to the Tibetan system of medicine, when a disease contaminating the inside of your body shows some sign of coming out, it generally means that you're getting better. It's coming out of the body and staying, instead of staying inside, getting larger and larger and lasting a long time. It's regarded as a good thing. It is still a sickness, but it's nonetheless regarded as good. Identifying the harms you receive as problems has great shortcomings. Think of all the problems you've experienced in your life. Then contemplate over and over again the result of seeing them as problems. Has it benefited you or not? Try to see as clearly as possible the shortcomings of this attitude. Then generate a very strong positive motivation, determining that from now on, no matter what problems I have to face, I won't become irritated by them. I won't identify any circumstances or obstacles I experience as problems. I regard them as positive. So when something goes wrong, you know, we look, should look at it as, as an opportunity. Generating this brave, determined attitude is extremely important for your thought transformation practice to succeed. With this strong motivation as a foundation, proceed to train your mind until you become like an experienced horseman. Even though his mind may be distracted, he's able to manage the horse effortlessly, no matter what it does, without falling off or endangering his life. He's able to cope because his body responds naturally to the way the horse runs. Similarly, when meeting miserable conditions or obstacles, an experienced thought transformation practitioner immediately and effortlessly recognizes them as good. The thought of liking problems arises naturally, like the thought of liking ice cream or the thought of liking music. When a person who enjoys music hears music, the thought of liking it arises naturally without any uh, need to consider the reasons. When you meet undesirable conditions, if you spontaneously recognize them as good, you'll be happy. During times of criticism, poverty, difficulties, failure, sickness, or even imminent death, nothing will disturb your mind. You will be consistently happy. Effortlessly, naturally, you'll recognize the benefits of problems 
And the more you see the benefits, the happier you will be to experience difficulties in your life. By training your mind and becoming accustomed to not seeing problems as problems, even great problems of the mind and body become so easy to bear that you experience no difficulty when you encounter them. Problems become enjoyable, as light and soft as cotton. So it's, uh, you know, as, as we were saying last week, it's um, when we look at the first teaching the Buddha gave, uh, on the, on, which was the, on the Four Noble Truths, you know, the four things seem to be true by those who have higher insight, you know, the no, so-called noble ones, the Aryas, you know, those who've realized the ultimate nature of their own mind. So the first is the truth of suffering. The kind of existence we have is fraught with suffering. Uh, you know, the, the three kinds of suffering, the suffering of suffering, changeable suffering, and pervasive suffering. So that's the human condition. That's the animal's condition. That's the condition of the sentient beings in cyclic existence. It's the nature of, of our lives, the suffering, dissatisfac dis dissatisfactoriness. And, you know, and the reason that we have to experience a life like that is because our mind and body are under the control of delusion and karma and have been since beginningless, beginningless time. And when we look at the karma that we've been creating since beginning of this time, um, there's very little positive karma. And the vast uh, majority of the karmas that we've created have been negative, you know, the causes of suffering. So it's not surprising that, um, you know, by far the greatest number of sentient beings are in the lower realms. They're in the lower realms because uh, rebirth is the result, of, your realm of rebirth is the result of a cause. And um, it's so easy to create negative karma, the cause of suffering. You know, that's our mind's default position to create negative karma because nearly everything we do, you know, based on uh, self-grasping ignorance, uh, we create negative karma by acting out of attachment or, or acting out of anger or any of the other, you know, branch delusions, the branch negative delusions. So, um, so there are very few sentient beings in cyclic existence born in the upper realms because the cause of being born in the upper realms and mainly the practice of morality is very much harder to create uh, you know we don't we don't know that there's such a thing as karma we don't know this positive karma and negative karma we we don't know that um, the principal cause of our all our experiences whether good or bad are uh, the principal cause is uh, in the mind you know we we always think that uh, what we're experiencing is a result of external factors and you know this is a big uh, secret of the dharma you know that the vast majority of people on earth don't know that the principal cause of experience comes from within our mind And, you know, we can see how since uh, humans have existed on the earth, nearly all their effort has been on external development, you know, manipulating the environment so that it's safe, comfortable, 
pleasant and so forth, you know, to a greater or lesser uh, degree of success. I mean, in terms of external or material development, it's, it's incredible what uh, people have done over the millennia, you know, and especially over the last, uh, I don't know, last 100 or 200 years, or since the Industrial Revolution, I guess, whenever that was, 1700s or something. Uh, and, you know, how fast things are developing, technology now and... Uh, um, but then we also see that there's a price to pay for that with the destruction of the earth and the atmosphere. So it's actually creating more problems than it's solving this external development. But, you know, not knowing any better, humanity is sort of plunging headlong uh, in that direction. All the while creating more and more negative karma. And therefore, you know, experiencing more and more problems. So this time, you know, we've received this perfect human rebirth. Uh, we've uh, met the uh, Mahayana Dharma. We've met Mahayana teachers. And uh, we've met the teachings of the Buddha that explain about the mind and karma. So, you know, since it's inevitable, we're going to experience problems and difficulties and hindrances and suffering of one kind or another. Uh, it's uh, essential that we learn how to deal with these situations constructively and, you know, not make, not compound uh, the harm by creating just more negative karma on top of it. So learn to respond positively and not just uh, learn to respond positively so that we don't create any more negative karma, but um, uh, you know, respond positively by, you know, seeing problems as good by understanding that um, this is a ripening of a previously created negative karma. So we're actually getting rid of it. Of course, the, the way to completely get rid of negative karma isn't by experiencing them one by one, otherwise we'd never get out of it. It's because I think we have an endless uh, supply of negative karma in our minds since our creating of neg negative karma is beginningless. So that's, you know, so the way to ultimately obliterate all the past negative karma in sort of one fell swoop is to realize emptiness, the ultimate reality of, um, our, of our own mind, because, you know, that's the root of all, the, the root of uh, all suffering is ignorance, uh, not realizing the, uh, um, the self, that the I is, is not self-existent. But in order to realize emptiness, we need a lot of merit. And uh, so that uh, entails purifying negative karma and creating positive karma. So by doing purification practices and studying and um, uh, studying the teachings on emptiness and meditating on them, then that way we can uh, destroy lots of karma at a, at a time but still, when negative karmas ripen one by one, we also have to deal with them on that, um, you know, individual basis.
So when these kind of situations that our mind labels negative, call, you know, problems, suffering, uh, then we, you know, see that as an opportunity to uh, get rid of that particular karma and um, uh, and, and not, not create more. So the next bit Rinpoche talks about is seeing problems as joyful. Uh, it's essential to be well prepared before actually meeting miserable conditions, since being able to use them uh, as a basis for virtue and happiness is extremely difficult. Without prior training, however, you can more easily apply the thought transformation practice you've been practicing. To transform problems into happiness, it's not sufficient simply to see that problems help your practice of virtue. This alone is not enough. You must clearly recognize that your problems are actually necessary conditions for your practice of virtue, and you can derive continual stable happiness from this. So, you know, one of the um, important practices that Shantideva goes to on about at length in the Bodhicharya Vatara, the Guide to Bodhisattva's Way of Life, is uh, patience. And uh, uh, and it's, uh, you know, uh, an important um, practice to develop to help us deal with you know negative situations and especially negative people you know people that in the teachings are called the enemy you know someone who doesn't like us someone that we don't like someone who uh, disturbs our mind someone who attacks us someone who criticizes us um, you know the world is uh, full of negative people and um, uh, And though, and you know, though, those, but um, the Bodhisattva, you know, and, and we as aspiring Bodhisattvas should welcome uh, such uh, encounters with harmful people so that, um, so that we can develop our practice of patience. Uh, and, you know, to a Bodhisattva, someone who's quite far along the path, you know, much further than we are, uh, sorry if I'm insulting anybody, um, but, uh, uh, someone who's much further along the path than we are, uh, you know, those people, th those uh, practitioners have such good karma that it's rare to uh, run into negative people or harmful people. So a bodhisattva sees an enemy, some, some unpleasant person is, is really precious because as we get further and further along the path, such people become fewer, uh, farther and fewer in between, you know, whatever the expression is. Um, few and far between. Um, so we're not there yet, you know, I think we meet plenty of unpleasant people, but instead of trying to avoid them, we should actually welcome uh, the opportunity to come into contact with those people. Uh, You know, one of the pities of the last election was that uh, opportunities uh, to practice patience with uh, uh, certain people now have become much, uh, much uh, less frequent. So, um, so I don't know, is that good or bad? Um, I'm sure we can find plenty of other, well, there's still plenty of other uh, people on that. 
I know I should be careful what I say because um, uh, there was one um, back when we were doing classes at Kurukula Center in person, there was one person who came to the classes who was a big fan of uh, uh, Mitch McConnell. And uh, uh, so if there are any such fans here, I apologize. But uh, he, he got very upset by uh, my always referring to him sort of disparagingly. And I shouldn't have done that, you know, he was, he was and still is a precious opportunity. So, uh, you know, we should welcome um, um, people like that in our lives. And, you know, if, um, if, if, you know, our daily, of course, our daily lives are a little different now than they used to be in that a lot of us don't go so many places where we used to go, even work. Um, but, you know, still, it might be, even with our more restricted lives, it may still be possible to, uh, the, we know ahead of time that we're going to meet uh, unpleasant or difficult people. Um, so, in, you know, what we can do in our morning meditation is uh, rehearse meeting the person who makes us angry and upset and um, practice reacting more positively, you know. Uh, I mean, sincerely positively, not acting positively in order to annoy the person further, you know, which can also be possible. But as Lama Zoparimsha has often said, you know, the enemy uh, is uh, our most precious possession because um, uh, through the enemy, we uh, have the opportunity to practice patience. And if we're only surrounded by people who are nice to us, we never get the opportunity to practice and develop our patience and then ultimately achieve the perfection of patience. You know, one of the uh, six bodhisattva perfections that we need to achieve in order to reach enlightenment. There's, you know, the great Atisha um, who re-established pure Buddhism in Tibet after um, uh, a difficult period where Buddhism was suppressed, um, you know, about a thousand years ago, I guess. Uh, he had um, three close disciples. There was uh, Dom Tomba, the Bodhisattva, his interpreter, who um, um, translated his teachings. He, he you know, uh, Tisha was from India, and so uh, his, uh, Dom Tomba, uh, who then founded the Kadampa tradition, talked about that several times. Um, he, uh, he translated, Atisha's teachings into Tibetan. So he was the closest disciple. Uh, and, uh, and then there was um, another disciple, I forget his name. He was a, a meditator. So he, he, he um, meditated in a retreat hut, spent most of his time in meditation uh, in a retreat hut and uh, um, near, near Atisha's house. And then the third one was the cook. And, and the cook was really, um, uh, you know, a foul tempered person and really annoyed everybody. And uh, uh, he, was, he was so rude and unpleasant to everybody. And uh, someone once said to a teacher, why, why, this guy is such a drag, you know, why do you, why do you keep him around? He said, don't, 
don't speak badly of, of uh, Manjala, the cook. You know, it's, you know, through him, I've perfected the practice of patience. So, you know, he, he even kept um, this unpleasant person around, you know, just in order to, uh, of course, once he perfected the patience, um, I don't know if you needed him anymore, but I think uh, at that point it didn't matter. So he just kept him around and gave other people the opportunity to practice with him, I guess. Um, I think that's why Wendy keeps me around so she can practice patience. Our, um, our great teacher, Geshe Zopa, uh, who passed away a few years ago, I don't know if any of you met him, uh, if you know who he is, he was Geshe Zopa. He was uh, Lama Yeshi's teacher from Tibet. And uh, he actually came, Geshe Zopa came to the States in uh, 62 and then eventually became a professor at the, um, in the university in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, And he was one of the important teachers of Lama Yeshi and Lama Zopa Rinpoche. And um, Wisdom published his, uh, in five volumes, his uh, extensive commentary on Lama Rim Chemo. You, do you have that, those five, a series of five books? Really important books. Um, you know, Lama Rim Chemo is like almost the most important text in the Gelug tradition. And um, Geshe Zopa's commentary is uh, not far behind, you know. He, he taught it uh, every Sunday or whenever it was, uh, over a period of 20 or 30 years, or over a long time, you know. And it's a really extensive commentary and Wisdom published it in five volumes. So uh, uh, in 1975, Lama Yeshe Lama Zopa Rinpoche's second trip to the States um, I was uh, fortunate enough to be their um, uh, um, roadie. You know, I accompanied them on this uh, on this trip, travel around the world uh, for eight or nine months. And um, at, at one point, uh, the Lamas went to visit Geshe Zopa in Madison, and um, I ran around did some other things and I joined them a little bit later when I went to to Geshe's house um, knocked on the door uh, this this guy Elvin who was uh, Geshe Geshe's kind of closest disciple and sort of his um, uh, manservant he opened the door and he, he looked really disheveled he was smoking a cigarette and all he was wearing it was quite hot, it was in August or September in the summer. Uh, all he was wearing was a, a towel around his waist. And I just, I mean, I, I don't even know if he had anything on underneath the towel. I didn't, I didn't look, but um, uh, it was like, I couldn't believe this semi-naked guy smoking a cigarette was, um, uh, lived with Geshe-la and looked after him and uh, all I could think of, well, you know, geshe -la's, he's he's like a teacher's cook for geshe -la, you know, he keeps him around to um, practice patience. But, you know, I couldn't think of any other reason, but, you know, what do I know? He tamed his mind and then Elvin became, uh, Elvin became a monk in the end and uh, had quite an auspicious death, so you never know. So if you're going to get a roommate, then get someone who's really hard to get on with and, and really tests your patience, you know, and uh, that, that's, uh, that's the practice of a bodhisattva. So it's, we have to recognize that problems are necessary conditions for our practice of virtue. 
and you can derive continual stable happiness uh, from this. During difficult times, remember that your problems are benefiting you immensely by allowing you to achieve not only temporal happiness, but also happiness in future lives, as well as liberation and the ultimate happiness of enlightenment. Even though your problems may be very heavy and difficult to bear, remember that they are the most joyful things to have because they benefit you continuously. As long as you see something as a problem and allow it to irritate you, you cause that problem to disturb your mind. While this is happening, there's no way to transform suffering into Dharma practice. But when you're able to stop seeing problems as problems, you're able to use suffering in your Dharma practice. Problems actually enable you to increase your good karma. They become the cause of happiness. Now, it's not enough to hear me say these things, this has to come from your own experience. Of course, you cannot suddenly face big problems and transform them into the Buddhist path. As much as you are able, train your mind to transform small sufferings. Then, when you experience big problems or great disasters, even death, the most fearful thing of all, you will be able to infuse them with virtue and use them in your Dharma practice to move further along the path to ultimate happiness. Nick? Yeah? This is Rebecca. Hi. Hi. Um, I had a question, but the, the last passage addressed it a little bit, but I wanted to ask, um, in the idea of problems and what is a problem, does that also include things like if you're grieving the loss of someone who dies? Like, I sort of feel like you're going to say yes, but that seems immeasurably more difficult um and is it the same kind of tool the way a problem is like a, an irritable uh roommate well um that's a good question uh of course you know we know everybody we know and uh, you know those who are close to us those who we don't even know and ourselves of course everybody's going to die so it's not um, you know I don't think it's a problem in the sense of the, the of, of sort of the difficulties that we may encounter if we um, uh, you know, drop a brick on our foot or bash our head on 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 a on a, on a cupboard door or something. You know, um, I think uh, there's um, you know the FPMT has a. Uh, do you know the prayers for the dead site that when the if you look up fpmt.org slash pfd prayers for the dead uh, it's a it's a thing when loved ones die or anyone dies people that don't pets don't make the cut but um uh, you can submit their name to there and his holiness and will make prayers and the sangha in rimshay's house in california will make uh tatas you know those little uh, clay tablets and do prayers for that for that person um, and uh, um, and then um, and you'll also get blessed pills and uh, and a bless, blessing string from Dharamsala will get get sent to you um, 
anyway, if you look at that site, so and then you can get on a email list to be notified whenever uh, it's sort of updated, um, you know, every two or three days. So sometimes that's the way you find out somebody died that, you know, you're not necessarily close to, but maybe somebody you knew or a Dharma student from another center or things like that. So there are two things that Rinpoche says to think when you uh, open that email and see all the people who've died since the last time you looked at the list. One thing is to pray for them, you know, especially people uh, that you're close to, but um, pray for all of them. And, um, and you can pray like, uh, you know, may these people who, who died, the people who on this list, may these people and all beings, uh, so you may as well extend it to all beings with bodhicitta, but as, uh, when you pray them, may they be reborn in a pure land where they can receive enlightenment. And if not, if they can't be born in a pure land where they can receive enlightenment, may they receive a perfect human rebirth, meet the holy Mahayana guru, practice dharma, never again be reborn in the lower realms, and quickly reach enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. So that's the kind of prayer. So, uh, you know, we pray for the people who've passed away recently like that, from that list. But then also think, visualize your, your own name. Sooner or later, my name's going to be on that list. And so use it to remind ourselves of our own mortality, our impending mortality, you know, understanding that, um, you know, death is certain, but the time of death is uncertain and can come at any moment. So use that as a, to spur our Dharma practice on, you know, and to not be complacent or lazy. So, you know, when, um, you know, I remember, um, I was in Bodh Gaya in um, 1981 and His Holiness the Dalai Lama was there giving teachings and um, the news came down that his mother had just died. And so, uh, you know, at, at, the, at the next teaching, uh, all Tibetans were weeping and wailing and making uh, a lot of uh, sounds of upset, you know, and um, His Holiness was like, come on, people, get a grip. There's what, what, nothing to be upset about. You know, she had a long and happy life. You know, she was the mother of the Dalai Lama. She did thousands of um, manis every day, uh, you know, reciting Amani Pemihum. This is the part where I wave my mala, but I can't find it. Um, uh, she said, and she's been reborn in a pure land. Well, well, you know, and I'm cool with it. You know, why, why are you upset? So, and then some years later, uh, when my mother died, um, I remember that, you know, and, um, uh, and, and she, you know, my mother, um, as I, uh, you know, after I got to Copan the first time in uh, 72, did the course, and I was kind of blown away by it, and I, I got religion, uh, and so um, I wrote, so I've been traveling for uh, six months or something on the road, and uh, sending mum, uh, the occasional postcard from Bali, from Thailand, from India, from wherever, Kathmandu. And then there was a month where 
radio silence. You know, we're doing the retreat, the course. And the next thing she gets is like this uh, 12 page evangelical, evangelical rave uh, that, you know, she's wasting her life and she's going to die soon. And uh, uh, if she, she doesn't practice Dharma, she'll go to hell. And uh, um, I mean, I, I've got, I wrote two or three long letters, you know, uh, and I mean, I've got a couple of them. She saved them. It's so cringeworthy. But um, uh, I, I think she probably thought I'd gone troppo. You, you know that expression, gone troppo? It's Australian, uh, gone, gone tropical, you know, the heat, the, the, the tropics have got to your mind. You, you've, they've started to rot your brain. You've gone crazy. You know, mad dogs and Englishmen. Um, so, uh, but at the end, I'd, I'd say, look, I can't explain this stuff. You really want to know what I'm um, into now. Uh, and, you know, it was a shock for her because, uh, um, you know, she, she was a card carrying atheist and she brought me up that way. And, um, you know, I went to Presbyterian school and when kids tried to, some of my friends tried to make me a Christian, she got pretty upset, she got a bit worried. And so she gave me Bertrand Russell's book to read, you know, why I am not a Christian, uh, Bertrand Russell. English philosopher, and um, uh, so we were happy scientific materialists, you know, uh, until I went to Nepal, got in, involved in Tibetan Buddhism. So I, I finish off there, say, well, I can't explain uh, really what's happening here. You, if you want to know, you have to come over yourself. So she did. So she came and did the next course, the, in the, the fourth course in spring of 73. And um, she became a Buddhist. And uh, so, and, and she became, you know, very close to the lamas and uh, uh, that became the main thing in her life, Buddhism, from the age of um, 60 to, uh, you know, for more than 30 years. So I kind of felt I've somehow repaid her kindness a little bit. And, um, but, you know, uh, Lama Sopa Rinpoche said she, she had visited her not long before she passed away. And, uh, uh, and, you know, he said she had a great life and she had absolutely nothing to, to worry about when she died that, uh, you know, Lama would look after her. And uh, so, you know, she was ready to go. And so I think she went to, I don't know where she went, Pure Land or, I don't know, but uh, her incarnation hasn't been recognized by any, by any Lama that I know of. But um, uh, so um, anyway, sorry, I got a bit off the topic there, Rebecca. Um, I think if, so, if somebody dies, we, we can pray for them in briefly in that way that I mentioned, we can, uh, ask the lamas to do pujas, medicine Buddha pujas or different uh, pujas. We can recite the king of prayers for them and we can use their death to remind us of our own and to uh, and use that. And in that way, that person's really benefiting us and indirectly all sentient beings by, you know, spurring our practice on, by reminding us of death uh, and um, at least for a while, keeping us, our mind a little more focused than perhaps it otherwise would have been. Um, so I don't think that's, so if we're upset, we, you know, when someone close to us dies, we, we need to look at what are we upset? Are we upset because that person didn't meet the Dharma? This person's almost certainly been reborn in the lower realms. You know, that's a cause to generate compassion and to make a determination to reach enlightenment more quickly so that we can rescue that person from suffering as well as all sentient beings, all other sentient beings. And, um, but often we find that we're mourning something that we've lost, something our attachment has been uh, harmed. And uh, 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 so, you know, we should look at our own attachment and self-cherishing if we're upset 
that somebody close to us has died and try to understand those negative aspects of our own mind. Um, but being upset doesn't really help that person. It doesn't help us. What do you think? That's helpful. I think the idea that it would be an opportunity to practice observing and um, observing that attachment and understanding it is, I, I can really understand that. That could be a lifelong pursuit right there. Well, and is really. Well, people are dying all the time and then then it'll be us. So, um... And Nick? Yeah. Uh, by Lama Zopa Rinpoche, uh, mm -hmm. one of the helps a lot with getting ready for our own death, plus, um, you know, How family you? members that have died. Uh, it's, it's come in. This is an amazing book. Amazing yeah. book. It's uh, how, to, how, to, how to enjoy yeah. death. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's helped a lot. <laughs> yeah. How's it helped? Just, uh, you know, my mother passed away not too long ago and, 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 you know, we weren't on the best of terms and, uh, and we had total different religious beliefs and and it just got me to 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 let go of that to not be attached to to you know that was basically the thing it was it was the attachment part of it that i was i was hung up on you know i was upset because i was attached you know and it's like that's <laughs> that's not helping either one of us, you know. No, no. no so you know, if it helps you see your attachment and uh, deal with it, um, uh, you know, with Dharma practice, then that's uh, then that's helped you too. That's a little bit. Is there anybody else? Yeah, is the uh, is my mic working? Hmm. So in relation to Rebecca's question, I recall a passage from um, the book you recommended, The World and Ourselves by Thubten Gyatso. One of the passages that you recommended we read has a kind of a, a concise answer to the exact thing that Rebecca was asking about um, whether one should, you know, feel suffering or, or grief over the death of a loved one or any sort of problem like that that isn't directly inflicted suffering on you. And uh, I'll just paraphrase it's on it's on two, page 201 if anyone wants to find it i believe it's one of the pdfs that bob sent out uh, the whole book of but um <clears throat> but you know he essentially said that um to have grief shouldn't be seen as heartless or callous it can be a sign of wisdom How, how's that <clears throat> Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just I'm just quoting the, the end of the of the phrase, but there's um it's part of uh, what was he talking about there? Um, he's talking about one of the four opposing forces to anger, but he's also it's also a broader commentary on dealing with suffering in general. Kind of same concept as what we're doing in this this whole segment of turning suffering mm -hmm. into an opportunity for for growth and patience. Yeah, it's uh, the world and what's it called? The world and ourselves, or something. Yeah, the world, the world and ourselves. Yeah, so that's, uh, if people don't know, that's um, a book written by Tupton Gatso, Adrian Feldman, Australian uh, monk, who uh, founded Nalanda Monastery in France and then went to Australia and founded another monastery there. Uh, so th this hits his... Um, uh, book on mind and mental factors basically and uh, when do we talk about that one of the previous can't even remember which uh, oh, yeah. module it was but 
we, we sent it out to everybody. So um, if anybody wants to get that, it's a, it's a very uh, good rundown on, on the topic, mind and mental factors. Um, do you still have it, Bob? Can't hear. Um, I have the link for it, yes. Yeah, so uh, if you want a copy of that, you can email bob at kurukula.org. He can send you a PDF of the book. I think we're getting, it was recently um, reprinted in Singapore, and I think they're sending us some copies here. So we may even have some uh, hard copies of it in book form uh, soon at some point. So uh, I'll let you know when that happens. Okay, so has anyone got any advice on dealing with the death of a loved one in, in the context of transforming problems? Okay. Okay, so um, what did I get up to? Stopping the thought of disliking problems and generating the thought of liking them makes the mind happy. With this attitude, you can always maintain your practice without depression or discouragement. Uh, because you've cultivated a strong belief that experiencing problems is desirable and joyful, even though you may have a problem, it will not disturb your mind and you will easily be able to bear it. This is how you can utilize disease and other problems in your life, such as uh, adversaries you believe are disturbing your happiness or your Dharma practice. You know, Lama Zop often, uh, Rinpoche often refers to, there was a, a Western student in Dharamsala who was um, uh, trying to develop single pointed concentration in a small hut out in, in, in the in the, in the hills there in Dharamsala. And uh, um, the, you know, the Indian shepherds used to let their sheep run around the area and they'd, they'd bleed, you know. So he would get very upset and he'd run out of his, jump up off his meditation seat and start throwing rocks uh, at the sheep because they were disturbing his meditation. So uh, he probably hadn't read this teaching. Even if they persist in what they're doing, they'll be utterly unable to interfere with your happiness and so cannot disturb your mind. You know, if you transform problems. In short, train, uh, train your mind to see the beauty in all problems. In order for problems to appear desirable to you, you have to stop looking at the shortcomings of situations. Put all your effort into looking at the benefits of problems. Whether a life situation is wonderful or not depends on the way your mind perceives and interprets it. You can choose to label an experience wonderful or problematic. You can choose to label it one way or the other. It depends completely upon your mind, upon your interpretation. Your experiences will definitely change as you change the way you think.
when I was in the Laudo cave, so everybody knows that Lama Zopa Rinpoche is, uh, the Laudo cave is uh, where in his previous life, Rinpoche spent the um, uh, last 20 years of his uh, life. He was a Nyingma Lama, married Lama. Uh, and uh, he spent the last 20 years of his life meditating in this cave in a place called Laudo up uh, in the Nepalese Himalayas up uh, uh, towards Mount Everest, near Mount Everest. And it was said that uh, he was such an accomplished meditator that he'd actually passed beyond the need for sleep and uh, he could just meditate 24 hours a day. Um, when I was in the Laudo cave many years ago, I found a text called Opening the Door of Dharma, the initial stage of training the mind in the graduated path to enlightenment. Um, and so uh, Rinpoche gave a teaching on that text uh, in a, and it's in a wisdom book called um, The Door to Satisfaction. Opening the Door of Dharma. This was the only general text I found there among the many other handwritten manuscripts of initiations and deity practices. So this belonged to his previous life. I must have read a lot in that text about the shortcomings of grasping onto worldly things, such as material goods or fame. After that, when, when the local people brought me offerings, for example, a plate filled with corn and rice, with some money on top so that was the Sherpas would um, it was a common offering the Sherpas uh, would make to the Lamas you know so a plate with some kind of food stuff and then some money on top which according to their custom is called a mandala I was very fearful because I realized the dangers of those offerings I was afraid of receiving a reputation and becoming famous. There was much to fear in my heart because I saw the pitfalls so clearly. So you see, at that time, I was trying to practice Dharma. Now, however, I've sunk completely into the quagmire of worldly concern. So what Rimsho is saying there is that um, um, he's trying to avoid the falling into the trap of the eight worldly Dharmas. Um, so, you know, the eight worldly dharmas are, um, you, everybody familiar with them? Uh, anybody want to tell me what they are? Molly, you said you knew what they are. Unmute. I said, uh, Oh, go ahead, Jeffrey. I'll let you go. No, no, no. I, do, I don't know them all. I just I very little. Yeah, it's kind of like praise and blame, happiness and unhappiness. Um, Good. Reputation, bad reputation. And I always miss one. So, Jeffrey, you can do that. No, that's the one I'm, I'm, I'm missing, too. <laughs> I always miss one of them. Uh, are, you, are you saying that the eight ordinary concerns? I, eight worldly I, concerns. Eight yeah, worldly I've, concerns, I've heard yeah. this before. I haven't heard the term. Was it fame, infamy, praise, Some criticism, um, mm -hmm. reputation, bad reputation, okay. happiness, yeah, unhappiness? Yes. Yeah, so they're, they're eight. They're four pairs of uh, opposites. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a, one is um, um, being pleased when receiving material things and being unhappy when material things are not received, um, then uh, so there's attachment to receiving things and aversion to not receiving material things. And then there's attachment to, uh, you know, things going well and uh, aversion to things not going well, you know, which Molly was saying is happiness and suffering. Um, you know, so always wanting to be happy and never wanting to, to be unhappy. So, and that's kind of relevant to what we're talking about here, really transforming problems. Um, and then there's um, 
fame, being attached to fame and having aversion to notoriety. And the other one is uh, attached to praise and aversion to blame. So, you know, those last two are a little bit similar, you know, having a good reputation, having a bad reputation. And so that's a little more general, you know. Um, And praise and blame are more personal when someone's praising you, you just, oh, you know, you, you're this, you're that, you're so good, blah, blah, blah. Uh, or the other one, you know, you're terrible, you know, really, this was your fault that this happened, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So those, those are um, common and they're emblematic of the uh, up and down nature of the worldly mind, you know. In fact, uh, over the years, Lama Zopa Rinpoche has um, given extensive teachings on the eight worldly dharmas. And um, uh, we even published a whole book about it called How to Practice Dharma. Um, so, uh, um, I can send the link to that, but that is a very important book, you know. And, uh, and that's what Rinpoche was saying when he found this, when he found this text that belonged to the Lao Lama in the cave, um, this uh, opening the door of Dharma. Um, he would he would have been um, around twenty five years old at that point. Um, he said when he read that book, he realised that. Up until then, all everything he'd done, uh, you know, he'd been a monk since he was little, um, everything he'd done, he hadn't been practicing Dharma. You know, he, he realized that after reading this book, that uh, everything he'd done wasn't the practice of Dharma. What he thought was the practice of Dharma wasn't, because it was done, um, it wasn't done free of the eight worldly Dharmas. Um, so, so here, when he's saying, you know, when they, When he returned to Laudo after, um, well, he was born near there um, in um, December 1945 um, in a little village called Tami, which is, uh, so it's down here in Laudo, a couple of thousand feet up the mountain uh, away from there. Um, and, and he, in the village, they sent, there was a Nyingma monastery in Tami. There was a local village monastery. So um, they sent him, after he was recognized as the reincarnation of the Lao Lama, he was sent um, to the local monastery. But since it was just down the road from his house, he kept running away from there going home. So then they sent him to um, another monastery in a place called Rolwaling, which was way over the mountain, a very difficult pass, and uh, with uh, sometimes uh, ice and snow in the winter and falling rocks, and uh, quite difficult for a little boy to navigate by himself. So they sent him over to Rolwaling, where his uncles were. In the, his uncles were in the monastery there. And um, uh, one or two uncles, either they were there already or, or they went there to look after him. Um, but uh, so he was there for a few years uh, until the age of 10 and when his uncles took him on pilgrimage to Tibet. So that was when he left that area in, in uh, mid fifties. And then uh, uh, in 59, he had to escape from Tibet. Uh, he stayed in Tibet. They took him on pilgrimage and he refused to um, come back to Nepal. He wanted to stay in Doma Geshe Rinpoche's monastery where, where they found themselves in Southern Tibet. So, um, so he stayed there for three years until they had to go into exile when the Chinese uh, took over. And, um, uh, and then he was in the refugee camp with, and met Lama Geshe and then, uh, uh, and then, uh, 
they met their first Western student. And then, uh, you know, in uh, 68, they went to Nepal and uh, finished up at Copan. And then in 69, I think he went back up to Lauda for the first time since he'd left uh, when he was 10 years old. And um, then they decided to build a small monastery there at Lauda. And uh, so it was while he was there during the construction of the monastery, uh, he was reading this text. And, um, and then the word began to spread, oh, the Laudo Lama, you know, has returned. So he had this quite big reputation from his previous life. So that was one thing that concerned him that he would get attached to the reputation and that would really harm his Dharma practice. So, and uh, then also um, receiving material offerings, uh, you know, if the word got around, oh, we offered this, we offered that then, people would try to outdo themselves, maybe make better and bigger offerings. So he, he was afraid that he'd get attached to the offerings. And then, um, you know, if you're a monk or uh, any kind of Dharma practitioner, really, uh, and people are making offerings and you get attached to them, it damages your Dharma practice, sort of puts it in reverse. Um, you know, the great Kunu Lama Rinpoche, who, um, uh, you know, we went through his commentary, was the last one or the module before, the foundation of all good qualities. Uh, I think it was the, first, the Buddhism in a nutshell. We did, we, we went through uh, Kunu Lama Rinpoche's commentary on um, the found, Lama Tsongkhapa's text, the foundation of all good qualities. Um, when people came to see him and they made an offering, he would take the offering and throw it <laughs> on the floor behind his bed, you know. So, you know, just to show his disdain for receiving material offerings and to discourage people from making them because he just, he didn't need them and he didn't want the hassle. And I remember um, we received a couple of teachings from him, uh, the Western monks and nuns who were there at the time, probably 15, 12, 15 of us. In 1975, the beginning of February 75, he was in, in Nepal. Um, and he said, I, I don't like receiving offerings. And he refused the offerings. We tried to offer him some money and stuff. He said, I, 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 don't, I don't need any money. I don't need anything. And especially, he was a layman. Um, uh, he said, I especially, I don't take offerings from monks and nuns, you know. Um, uh, uh, and I don't have anything material to give you, but I'll, um, but I do have a transmission of this mantra. Uh, so then he gave us the, uh, he tra gave us a transmission of the Shakyamuni Buddha mantra, Tatom Mune Mune Soha. Did I share that with you guys? Yeah. Um, so he said, uh, I'll give you this, uh, offer you this mantra. And he gave us a transmission and he said, when you go back to the West, then you can share this offering with others. Um, so that was his uh, offering to us. So that's, um, you know, Song, I think Song Rupeshe said, or somebody said, or some Lama said, um, that they say they see material offerings as um, molten copper poured into your mouth. Uh, I mean, it's by you know, if you accept material offerings as a supposed practitioner and then you don't practice purely, uh, then you're really stealing those offerings uh, from you know, devoted followers and uh, the karma of uh, deceiving people like that by pretending to be a practitioner and taking their offerings and then not doing uh, proper practice is definitely a cause to be reborn in one of those hells where you um, um, get boiled in um, a cauldron of uh, molten metal and have uh, molten metal poured into your throat. So that was Sorry, lost my mother. Here it is. Um, so that was uh, 
uh, that's the Lama's attitude to material offerings. But we shouldn't use that as an excuse. Oh, well, I don't, I don't want, I don't want uh, my Lama to be reborn in molten hell, so I won't make any offerings. That's uh, our responsibility is to make the offerings. Uh, their responsibility is to um, uh, deal with them properly. <laughs> Okay, so moving right along. So that's the end of that chapter called, which is called Developing a Different Attitude to Problems. The next one is uh, happiness and suffering are created by your mind. The Buddhist teachings tell us um, all existence depends on the tip of the wish. All existence depends on the tip of the wish. What that means is all happiness and all suffering depend on our wish, our motivation. The most oppressive suffering of the hell realms and the highest happiness of the state of omniscient mind come from the mind. With few exceptions, all actions we perform with our body, speech and mind out of worldly concern, concern only for our own happiness in this life alone, uh, are non-virtuous and thus result in suffering. All actions of body, speech and mind done with the wish that seeks happiness beyond this life, seeks happiness of future lives, or seeks the happiness of all beings are virtuous and cause our happiness. So um, someone once asked the greater teacher, um, what, are the, what's, what, what are the results of actions done with ignorance, attachment and aversion? And he said, you know, actions done with, out of uh, ignorance, attachment, aversion result in rebirth in the lower realms. And actions done with non-ignorance, non-attachment, and non-aversion result in rebirth in the upper realms. Through these actions, we can experience happiness in future lives as well as this life. So all actions of body, speech and mind done with the wish to achieve liberation from the bondage of karma and disturbing thoughts are virtuous and are themselves the cause of liberation. And all actions of and all actions of body, speech and mind done with the wish to achieve enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings are not only virtuous, but also the cause of enlightenment. Once you realize this, you perform positive actions all day and night. And all these actions become the cause to achieve the ultimate peerless happiness of the state of enlightenment. So as I, I said last week, you know, um, we have a perfect human rebirth and of the um, three ways in which a perfect human rebirth is highly meaningful. Uh, that is, you know, it's uh, useful in achieving temporal goals, you know, through understanding how karma works, we can create the cause to be wealthy in future lives or to be handsome or beautiful in future lives, to be popular in future lives. Um, you know, if we understand karma, uh, cause and effect, we know which causes bring which results, then that's one benefit, you know, of course, those, those are um, not particularly useful benefits, but, um, you know, it could be useful to be born very wealthy and then to be able to use that wealth to support the Dharma and the Sangha and to, um, you know, build Dharma centers or, uh, you know, benefit sentient beings in the temporal ways, you know, with the food, medicine, shelter, clothing. So, you know, there are advantages 
um, uh, to being wealthy like that. But um, uh, the greater temporal benefit really is being able to uh, create the causes to receive realizations of the path, to realize a perfect human rebirth, to realize impermanence and death, to realize refuge, to realize karma, to realize um, these uh, stages of the path. So those temporal benefits then, um, you know, that's one meaningful, one way in which perfect human rebirth is meaningful. The second way is it's meaningful to achieve ultimate goals, such as uh, liberation from psychic existence, which is ultimate in the sense that there's no falling back into psychic existence once we've attained liberation, because we've um, extirpated from our mind the cause of psychic existence, ignorance of the uh, nature of our own mind. You know? So once we've transcended our ego, there's no cause for the ego to come back the wrong conception of the self so we realize the truth but it's not ultimate in the sense that it's not the end of the road we still have a long way to go to reach enlightenment but this perfect human rebirth is also useful to create the cause of enlightenment through uh, studying and practicing bodhicitta so um, uh, it's useful in achieving these ultimate goals and the third way that the human, perfect human rebirth is meaningful, it's meaningful in um, uh, every moment. So every moment we can use our, our life um, to create the cause of enlightenment by transforming every moment with bodhicitta. And so since our life uh, in cyclic existence is uh, beset by problems and uh, you know, difficult situations and stuff, if we learn uh, how to transform these problems, then even when problems and difficulties arise, we can uh, make them, uh, you know, through the alchemy of bodhicitta, we can turn those problems into the cause of enlightenment. So, um, uh, that's how, uh, one of you know the great use, usefulnesses of this perfect human rebirth that uh, uh, if we know how to practice thought transformation even when things appear to be going wrong we can uh, transform that into um, a positive experience and the cause of enlightenment so as Rinpoche says I'll repeat that all actions of body, speech, and mind done with the wish to achieve enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings are not only virtuous, but also the cause of enlightenment. Once you realize this, you perform positive actions all day and night. So, as a perfect human rebirth says, every moment can be positive. And all these actions become the cause to achieve the ultimate peerless happiness of the state of enlightenment. So that is why the Buddha's teachings say that all of existence depends on the tip of the wish. Everything depends completely on the mind. Temporal and even ultimate happiness depend completely on your wish, on your own mind. Different results come from different types of wishes. All suffering arises from the misguided wish for your own temporal happiness in only this life. This kind of happiness seems to be happiness, but is, it is really only suffering. This is samsaric happiness, which cannot be found because it does not exist. However, from the wish to achieve liberation comes liberation. From the wish to achieve the omniscient enlightened mind comes the omniscient enlightened mind. Thus samsaric suffering and ultimate happiness come completely from your own wish, from your own mind. If you closely examine your own experience, you'll see that happiness and suffering are dependent upon your mind, upon your interpretation of events and circumstances. 
Happiness and suffering do not come from outside, from others. All of your happiness and all of your suffering are created by you, by your own mind and motivation. You'll experience suffering if you cultivate and indulge in anger, and you'll experience happiness if you practice loving kindness, compassions, compassion and patience. Your suffering and happiness are the direct result of the way in which you take care of your own mind in your life on a day-to-day -day basis. If you closely examine your own experience, it becomes very clear that suffering and happiness are not created by other living beings and not even by a being such as God or Buddha. You are the creator of your own happiness and suffering. So, you know, as we like to say, the central philosophy of Buddhism is it's all your own fault. Of course, you know, if we think that I'm a practitioner of thought transformation, if I suffer, uh, I can use that suffering uh, as, as a step towards enlightenment. Therefore, it's okay if I create negative karma, because when, when I experience the suffering result, I'll be able to transform it into the path to enlightenment. Because the problem with that is that uh, if we practice creating negative karma, we're likely to be born in a situation where we can't practice Dharma, where even the word Dharma doesn't exist. So there's, <laughs> there's a mantra that, um, um, you know the mantra for blessing your feet? Um, I think we did, um, uh, in one of the modules, we did um, uh, the method for transforming a suffering life into happiness, is it establishing a daily practice. I think maybe it's, we did that in the last round of modules and it's coming up. Is this the third one of this series? So it's, it's supposed to be the next one, the fourth one, if we live that long. Um, So th that mantra, there's a mantra for uh, blessing the mala, and there's also a mantra for blessing the feet. So if we, om prasara gana hungri soha. So if we recite that mantra seven times and then spit on the soles of your feet or your shoes, um, then, or you can even do it on the tires of your car or, or, or your bike, um, then it's said that any uh, insect that you uh, step on uh, experiences bliss in their mind and gets reborn uh, uh, in an upper realm, in the God realm or something like that. So then I remember I said to Rinpoche once when he, he was explaining that mantra, I said, so if, um, if we recite that mantra and bless our feet, then wouldn't it make sense that we go out and we step on as many ants and other sentient beings as possible and send them to the upper realms? And then he thought, that he laughed and laughed. He said, that was such a, a ridiculous notion. And he said, yes, yes. And what you should do is get those clown's shoes, you know, the really, <laughs> the really huge shoes that clowns wear and bless them, and then you can even kill more sentient beings as you walk around, you know. So the um, the missing word in, in that whole thing is inadvertent. So um, if you bless your feet, and then you inadvertently step on any sentient being, it, it blesses that sentient being's mind through the power of that mantra and the blessing and your pure intention. Um, so, you know, it's not that easy to send, to transfer sentient beings' consciousness to the upper realms.
I think I think I'll uh, stop here. But does anybody have any questions about anything? Anything? No. Uh, can you repeat that 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 mantra again <laughs> about the uh, blessing? I'll, I'll 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 send it to Bob. He can send it out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's going to be in our next uh, teaching. Uh, no, our, our next uh, manual, uh, what do you call it? Module. Module. Um, yeah, I think I haven't really thought about it, but um, uh, that is, it's establishing a daily practice. That's um, the daily practice that Lama Zopa Rinpoche uh, recommended. It has um, a lot of different um, parts to it. Um, right. I don't remember, maybe I didn't finish it as usual, last time, uh, maybe we didn't get to the end, maybe you didn't get to that mantra, but, um, but don't you have that we sent it out, how to transform a suffering life into happiness? Um, I, I think, we, 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 you remember Bob, we sent it out? I don't remember. Okay, anyway, never mind, I'll, I'll send out the mantra again, you know. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So there's that mantra, and um, what else do I have to send? Short-term memory loss. Uh, I haven't talking about the been, book by been smoking. So what? You're talking about the book by Thubten Gatsio? Yeah. But oh, Bob I has that anyway to send out, so. Uh, anyway, there's a couple of things I, I referred to, so I'll, I'll I'll send you some stuff tonight or tomorrow morning, Bob, and then. And if anybody's not on his list, you can write to Bob at kurukula.org, and uh, uh, he can send. And if you want the stuff that we sent out last week, he can send that again. Okay. Um, so anyway, if you think of any questions, you can uh, always email me, nick at lamieshi.com. Uh, and if you don't have this book, uh, um, I think it's got a different cover, hasn't it? Um, yeah, that one that uh, Jeff's got there. Um, well worth getting. Um, and thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to share my ignorance. Uh, so anyway, we have been reading Lama Zopa Rinpoche's teachings, uh, and we started with generating bodhicitta. So no question that we have a um, vast amount of merit to dedicate. So to preserve that merit, to um, send this positive energy that we've created towards its intended goal. Uh, we'll dedicate the merit. So think, you know, because of this merit, so you know, think of the merit we've generated by generating bodhicitta and doing right action of uh, reading Ripshay's teachings. Because of this merit, May I quickly become enlightened in order to enlighten all sentient beings. Okay, so remember, Go out and get an annoying roommate. Thanks, Do you want this to practice? So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Cecily. Nice to see you. So I had a Wendy and the bunnies. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you all. Thank, Thank you. you again. Hope to see you next week.
Bye. Have a good week. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nick. Thank you.